Welcome to Short Takes on Geography with Dr. Lisa Benton Short, Professor of Geography at the George Washington University and Chief Reader of Advanced Placement Human Geography. Join us as Dr. Short interviews Dr. Parag Khanna, geostrategist, world traveler, and best-selling author, discussing central concepts in the AP Human Geography curriculum through the lens of his new book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. This discussion series is brought to you by the American Geographical Society, the foremost champion of geography for the benefit of society since 1851. And now, over to Dr. Lisa Benton Short. Hi, welcome back geographers. My name is Lisa Benton Short, and this is our third of eight conversations with Parag Khanna about uh, meaningful challenges in the 21st century. And today we're gonna talk about cultural patterns and processes. Um, as you know, the cultural unit explores how societies have constructed themselves over time and over space. Language, religion, and ideas about who we are and what is important to us as individuals and as communities are fundamental to the concept of culture. And so I wanna ask Parag to start with a map. I sure will, Lisa, happy to oblige. <laughs> well, you know, first I'm just by really using the word culture so centrally in this unit, it just really uh, is, is so important to, to uh, explain why the subject of human geography is so vital to, um, to, to, to young people study today, because not many other disciplines are going to just take a unit about culture and put it so centrally and force us to grapple with just answering the question, what is culture? What does it mean? And you hinted at language, religion, other kinds of you know, social practices and norms. And culture is all of those things. I, I remember thinking about this a couple of decades ago, and, and I came up with my own definition of culture. My definition was how we raise our children. That's our culture. Right? And there are so many different ways that we raise our children, so many different aspects of raising a child. And all of them reflect your culture in some way. And so that's the micro level, right? That's the family you know, uh, level of understanding what culture is. But what if we step back to the biggest possible level? You know, how broadly can you define a culture? Some would say that, well, it's these civilizations that have existed at various points in time, and they have shared a cultural glue internally. So what I'm showing you here is a map of Asia, this largest region of the world with the, with the largest human population, with the oldest uh, you know, uh, traceable record of human uh, settlements. So we have the most evidence uh, of throughout history, you know, 6,000 or so years worth of evidence around Asian civilizations and cultures. So what I've done here on this map is to actually just layer them one upon the other upon the other, starting at the bottom, the Indus civilization from uh, 5500 BC, all the way through the Russian Empire that collapsed uh, 30 years ago in 1991. These have been the major empires of Asia. And why do I uh, you know, depict the map in this way? Well, you can't really find hard boundaries between them. Instead, you really see it as layers of paint. Imagine if every student in your classroom right now was given a different bucket of paint with a different uh, color and had to paint on it. And you would have so much overlap and blending, you would be creating all new colors. And so when we look at our political map, right, we actually see these rigid national boundaries. But when you look at a cultural map of the world through history, you actually see an incredibly lit rich set of overlapping colors that have really shaped each other. And the truth is that if you want to understand the history of any one civilization, you really can't without understanding the neighboring civilizations and their culture, because they have influenced each other so much over thousands and thousands of years. And that's really true of every single part of the world, not just here uh, in Asia. So those historical layers that we can, and this is of course the beauty of uh, geography, we can map them. You know, we can really prove it and show it who was here and when, and what were the artifacts they left behind? And what is it that the next 
civilization borrowed and learned, right? What did the Romans learn from the Greeks, for example? And how did that pass its way on uh, and carry on down to modern European cultures? Then, of course, the flows of people across. So all of that leads to, you know, when people say Asia or Asian, sometimes you have one particular kind of face in mind. It could be Chinese complexion or some other Asian nationality. Every face you see here is from a country that is Asian, that is geographically Asian. And really no two of these people look anything alike, right? But they all in some way are connected by those thousands and thousands of years of, uh, of Asian history. So to me, you know, culture has a very deep and intimate relationship to space uh, and to geographic concepts and to geographic learning because wherever you are in the world, some culture was there before you. And you probably in some ways in your daily rituals um, have, have, have absorbed that culture that came before you, even if you don't even know it. Yeah, and you know, it does, it, it makes it a very complex map too, right? I mean, that those boundaries are so indistinct. Um, and we could look, you know, that, that wonderful map of Asia that you had um, in the previous slide, we could, we could do that even at a very local level, neighborhoods, um, and, you know, the boundaries of neighborhoods in a city are oftentimes contested uh, by those who live here. You know, oh, I live in the DuPont area. No, you don't. You live in outer more Lo um, Logan Circle. Um, and so, um, you know, understanding that culture can be very, very tricky to define and also not have these neat boundaries that line up with our current political map. Um, you, may, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, how do we kind of understand, say, the role of religion in these complex cultural um, spaces? Sure. Well, you know, you're reminding me of an example from when I was growing up in New York. And for anyone out there who's a New Yorker, think about, well, you, you wouldn't, you're probably, you're a lot younger than me. But uh, <laughs> the, the boundary between Little Italy and Chinatown um, in the East Village and Lower East Side of Manhattan has been very labile, very malleable. It's shifted by blocks, entire city blocks in, in varying directions over time as Chinese people have moved in and Italian people have moved out and other people have moved in. But then, of course, the New Yorkers, which who come from all walks of life, who go and hang out in Chinatown and Little Italy are uh, also a sizable number. And for us, it's we are going there precisely to experience both Chinatown and Little Italy at the same time. And what we love about the neighborhood is that it isn't one or the other, the way it might appear on a map, is that it is both. And so you actually have three or four layers going on. Um, and and that's, that's part of how you know, dense urban spaces that are so multicultural are not just places where you witness boundaries among, um, you know, or in a territorial way, but you witness their overlap and you witness their fusion. And another neighborhood that I've lived in, um, uh, slightly further north, Murray Hill um, in Manhattan, there, you know, is one of the places where Chindian food really got started, right? You had a sufficient number of Chinese and Indians. And my wife and I used to joke, well, there must be some cloud kitchen underground <laughs> where they're all getting the same dishes and food because all these Chindian restaurants have, have popped up. So it's the fusion that I find so interesting. And, and, and then now panning back to that global level, Lisa, it's so fascinating. So look at the spread of religions, right? You know, you have um, the Philippines as one of the most populous uh, Catholic countries in the world, right, of course, with a much larger population than Italy. Of course, the most populous Muslim countries in the world are not Saudi Arabia or Egypt. It's Pakistan and Indonesia. And even India, which is mostly Hindu, has almost more Muslims than any other country in the world. So again, over time, you can't genuinely associate um, you know, a religion with a political space, right? You can't limit it. Uh, in fact, political space has been defined sometimes or segmented by religion, but then religion always spills across uh, them because religion has universalistic uh, ambitions. So I think the forces of history, whether it is the spread of religion 
or then imperialism and technology have all played a major role in spreading culture. And if we look at the way in which the world, again, is bordered and, and bounded uh, in terms of and segmented into nations and sovereign political units, well, that's obviously a legacy of European imperialism. So wherever people are in the world, they may not have European social culture, European religion or European languages, but they're shaped by the cultural events of the religious wars of Europe in the 17th century that gave rise to sovereignty in the Westphalian system of nation states. And that then was expanded through European colonialism. So whether it's a religious force or a technological force or whether it was economic ambition, all of those have been drivers of spreading culture, cultural practices and norms. And then of course, we have what some people would call a reverse colonialism because today, who are the largest foreign populations or non-European, non-Caucasian populations in Great Britain, for example? Well, it's of course Indians and Pakistanis. Those were large, the, India, the Indian subcontinent was the jewel of the British Raj, the jewel of the British Empire. And now you have um, you know, almost uh, eight to 10% or so of the population of Great Britain is South Asians. So colonization in one direction, reverse migration in the other direction. And the, what, what's the result? The favorite food by, uh, by every BBC survey in Britain is Indian curry, not fish and chips. Yeah, yeah. Um, which kind of, it, that kind of um, uh, begs the question, do you think differences in language and religion are becoming more or less significant as we see these layers upon layers, as we see fusion and hybridization happening? Um, what do you think is going to happen in the future? I think there's um, a, a wild card in all of this. And, you know, fusion has been at least a you know, pretty common theme in, in my sort of theory and in my observation around the world. And I'll tell you why. It comes back to youth. The wild card is a global youth culture. And that global youth culture to me is syncretic. You know, it synthesizes ideas that let's take spirituality, right? You know, Eastern spirituality, um, you know, blended potentially with a, you know, sort of a, a still increasingly secular Western youth. But even if they're less religious, they're still spiritual because they have had more exposure through technology or travel to Eastern culture. And so youth today, because of travel and technology, are more and more conversant in each other's cultures at a global level. And, we, and I find they share certain values. And, and today's youth, today's Generation Z, is the most surveyed generation that's ever lived. We've been probing and asking you questions, you know, uh, take, giving you surveys on iPads and everywhere you go for the last 10, 15 years. And we haven't been able to do that for previous generations. Your, you know, your and my generation, Lisa, never you know, get, shared so much data about ourselves. So what can we say about this global youth culture based upon all of that information? Well, we can say that young people believe in sustainability, they believe in mobility, they believe in connectivity. And these are the kind of secular religions, you might say, that constitute this global youth culture. So the way you and I might define culture, Lisa, is um, really changing because youth have these common values, these common virtues on a global scale that defy these geographical or political boundaries. And so to me, that's very exciting to think about culture, not in those rigid ways that we might have learned, you know, a long time ago, but in really new ways. So I'm wondering how, if you're encountering that in the classroom uh, with young students, would you say that, that they represent or embody a global youth culture? I, absolutely. I think, you know, the way that social media and media in general and new technologies have really allowed ideas to, to diffuse so quickly, um, but then also to be, um, to, be, to be shaped in different places differently. But I do, you know, you were talking about some of the, the values or um, the shared ideas that youth culture have. And I, um, it is, I think, 
kind of representative of how, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, uh, the time space convergence factor and that this is a generation that has really benefited from that kind of convergence of, of technology that has allowed that exchange of, of ideas um, to really permeate around the world, creating kind of this really interesting um, potential future for us. Um, and um, I think that one of the interesting things and most important things about the cultural unit is for us to see this dynamic process unfolding. And, and yet it's also very connected to history. So you also have to see kind of the historical context, the bigger pictures, these maps of dynasties to understand some of the cultural um, ways that, and, and, and ideas that are important today. Um, so I'm going to say thank you for joining us in our discussion on Unit 3, and we look forward to seeing you um, in our Unit 4 discussion on political patterns and processes. Thank you for joining us for this segment of Short Takes on Geography with Dr. Lisa Benton Short. Tune in for this and more great geography teaching resources at AmericanGeo.org. Until next time.